Please, let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for those 20-year-old engineers that created Zoom. <laughs> thank you for the opportunities to come together. We thank you for the willingness to be the church. Lord, may you be in us and with us and around us and through us during our time together that we will be re-energized and ready to go out and engage others in your good works. And we thank you for the leadership here and for everyone who thought it not robbery to spend an hour in the early evening to dream new dreams, to see new possibilities. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, we're here tonight to disco. <laughs> oh, man. Leave me hanging. Recorded <laughs> everything. <laughs> now, we are so excited. Uh, Tracy and I have been promising since the Bay Retreat to um, provide an opportunity to keep working with Amy and Annie because we had so much fun and we knew mm -hmm. there was more to learn, more uh, riches to receive. So welcome to our informational session on Discover, Connect, Act, which we will be referring to as Disco or Disco Act. Um, we're going to have fun, even while we learn more about following Jesus and learning, leaning into who God is calling us to be. So that's enough for me. Annie and Amy, whoo, take it away. It's good to see you again. <laughs> It's great to see you and great to see some familiar faces. I know I've been with some of you before in person or on Zoom, um, and so that's fun as well. Um, I've got a few slides that Annie and I are going to use to orient you, kind of introduce you to a process that we call Discover, Connect, Act, or in the Newcastle Presbytery, Disco. Um, <laughs> And want to just give you a little bit about what it's about with the hope that you might receive the invitation to join in and what we've got planned for about the next six to nine months. So, uh, okay, if I start to share my screen and do just a little bit of a overview and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and then plenty of time, I think, uh, Cindy and Tracy, for you guys to add in what um, you want to add in about this. And then, uh, yeah, plenty of time to invite your questions in. So Discover, Connect, Act, um, those words refer to um, how we think of a process for engaging your communities in a way that's three phases. So discovering your community, discovering what God might be already up to in your community so that you can join in, connecting with neighbors and other potential partners, and connecting more deeply to what God is calling your church to do in the community, and then moving into action. So there's kind of a, um, a, a process where we discover, connect, act, but it it's always discovering, always connecting, and then always acting in kind of in an iterative um, iterative way. Uh, and before I go a little bit further into that, I thought maybe you might just want to know a little bit about Annie and I, for those of you who haven't met us before, and I'm going to invite Annie maybe to start us off just sharing who she is, who we are, um, and then we'll get more into this model. Sure. Um, I'm Annie Allen. I am an uh, ordained minister currently serving in the United Church of Christ. I've also served in the Presbyterian Church and the United Methodist Church. Um, I was ordained Baptist. I've worked in Episcopal churches. I believe I have commitment issues. However, <laughs> um, it has given me a broad, broad breadth and depth to my faith and 
what God has called me to do. One of the things that I'm most passionate about is what we used to call asset-based community development. I it sort of mer morphed into community engagement. And uh, I have been, um, well, I had spent about six, seven years with communities of Shalom out of the United Methodist Church. And that was a international program that put together cohorts of churches in what back then we called Shalom Zones. And a Shalom Zone at that time was a group of churches that got together around a specific geographical area to bring God's health and healing and wholeness to that community. And um, we had 136 sites around the country, uh, including Haiti and Malawi and Uganda. And uh, it was during those years, it was funded by the uh, Board of Global Ministries in the uh, United Methodist Church. It was housed at Drew University, where I received my MDiv and where I started ministry. Uh, after that, I had uh, gone in the parish ministry where that I've been now, I don't know, maybe 12 years or so. I'm second career pastor out of uh, education. Uh, so during that those Shalom days, which were about 15 years ago, I met Amy. And Amy was one of our national trainers. And she and I and a couple other people revamped this curriculum to make it EPIC. And you'll hear that a lot. EPIC stands for experiential, participatory, image rich, and connective. Our favorite word, connective. So uh, I met Amy during that time. And right in the beginning of COVID, I don't know who reached out first, but it turned out we were both learning Zoom right away. It was in March of that year, that much I remember. And what we did was we started talking about our passions, which we share in terms of community engagement. And the next thing you know, we're writing curriculum, we're sharing it with lots of other bodies in, in uh, various denominations. and brings us right up to where we are now. And we've been doing this together. Uh, we did it during Communities Shalom Days, and now we've been doing it together uh, since the beginning of beginning of COVID, when everything was on Zoom. So we are totally comfortable in this space, and we'll throw you into breakout rooms, or we may just disappear and have you work. You never know on Zoom. But um, that's just a little bit about me, and I'll throw it toss it back over to Amy. Yeah, and a little bit about us, where our, our first meeting together and working together since 2008. Um, and just a little bit about me, I am a lay person. I'm a United Methodist lay person and also seminary trained. And I have been working at the intersection of church and neighborhood for about 20 years. Um, don't look. Uh, at the gray. <laughs> um, and that's really my passion. And I think that's where Annie and I just find such similarity is working at that in intersection of church and neighborhood. And that's really what this is about, um, is helping your congregation more deeply connect to the geography that God has given you, whether it is a neighborhood or a small town or one of those lovely beaches that you guys have <laughs> in Delaware, is how do we more authentically connect with community in a way that's life-giving and God-centered and God-inspired. And so that's really what motivates me um, in this work and to come alongside congregations as they do that. So Discover, Connect, Act is a process. It is a process that Annie and I will facilitate you through. And so along the way, there'll be a little bit of learning. Here's a tool and lots of invitation to go use that tool in your community and to bring back to all of us what you're learning. And we'll, we'll work together and, and really sort of nuance what we're what we're learning and share and learn from each other. Um, as I said before, it's we divided into three phases. 
discovering, connecting, and then acting. And so we really emphasize that you want to spend time just discovering and being present in your communities before you jump to some sort of decision about what's the thing um, that you're going to do. And at the same time, along the way, there's opportunities to take little next wise steps and actions um, because it's also part of our discovery. A team, which we'll talk about in, in a minute, we're gonna invite you to, to recruit a team from your church, a design team that will be equipped to engage your community, to build relationships and partnerships, and to nurture connections beyond the walls of the church. And all of this, Annie and I will, will be your guides and bring to you all of the tools um, that we can think of that are applicable to your context and to where you are at the stage of connecting with your, your town or neighborhood. And you've already heard a little bit of that. We will be your guides. Um, Annie, you want to say anything more here with the Discover Connect Act? Um, oh, yes. It when as we're doing this process, and it may be six months or eight months. I don't know how long we'll we'll be doing this, but over a period of time, we also change the way we think about community. We change the way we think about church, about our role in the community. And uh, we I like to call those mindset shifts. Uh, we, uh, we shift our thinking from scarcity to abundance. We often look at communities as a set of problems that need to be solved. If you may look at it at, look at your community as uh, Babylon. I know I've had a few of those uh, uh, those calls that I felt uh, God had just sent me into exile. And once we start engaging in the communities and engaging people in neighborhoods, we find that it is abundant. Every single congregation, I don't care if you have 44 80-year-olds sitting in the pews, they are rich with with skills and knowledge and gifts. So we, we change our thinking from scarcity to abundance. So of course we can do this. We can find partners to do things with. Uh, the other mindset shift we talk a lot about is doing with as opposed to doing for. How many of you have, how many of you have often had a mission team meeting inside the church and you sit around the table and you decide what is needed out there. People are hungry. We've got to have a food bank. And we go and we create one and no one shows up. And it's not that people aren't hungry, it's that maybe in that community, people are more care more about public safety or street lights. Or we you don't we don't know until we really ask and engage. So we we move from doing ministry for people, we call that charity, right? Uh to doing ministry with people and there's a huge difference i i'm sure all of you had had things done to you and um we'd like to do ministry alongside our neighbors and not do ministry to people and um, we reiterate that in many different ways over the course of this process and the last thing is moving from charity to justice we fully understand that we have to meet immediate needs. If there's a situation where people need food, we need to feed them. We're called to feed them. We're demanded to feed them. But we also have to look, what I like to say, look upstream is what is causing that hunger. And most of the time, if people are homeless, we'll ask why are people homeless? As opposed to, okay, we gotta make shelter. It was just two quick examples. So moving from charity to justice moves us into systemic change, talking to our legislators about unjust laws possibly, or looking at the structure of our society in which we live. Mass incarceration is a great example of a systemic problem. The problem's not necessarily crime. The problem may be something much more complicated than that. Uh, so we, we start moving towards systemic change at the same time, we have to feed 
the we have to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and shelter the homeless. So those are our mindset set shifts that go along with that. Some of them, a few of them. <laughs> yeah, there probably, probably are many more that we do with these. Yeah, these sure. are the main ones. Thank you, Annie. So a key element for what we have designed is that every congregation who accepts the invitation to participate in this process will have it's a design team of three to five people. And it's the design team that Annie and I are primarily working with and then helping that design team, equipping that design team to then sort of ripple out into your congregation and bring other people along in your congregation and certainly rippling out into your community. So that's a really key element is that a congregation that chooses to participate has a design team. And a lot of the work will be done virtual as Annie has mentioned Zoom. So over the six to nine month process, you can anticipate a uh, meeting with us on Zoom for an hour and a half, um, maybe anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 times. Some of it will be learning a new tool. Some of it will be bringing back what you've been discovering in your communities. And Annie and I always like to fill it, facilitate sharing across congregations and learning from each other. And so that will be part of our time together on the Zooms. And hopefully you, you heard something that's not in a bullet point as much as it is in that last one is you'll be given tools and invited to go and use them in your community. So there's also an element of time where that last bullet, where you're hopefully inviting others from your congregation to go into the neighborhood with you, whether it's a neighborhood walk or going to talk to the principal at the school or things that'll be very concrete and will help you think through. But there will be some invitation to actually apply the things that Annie and I are bringing to you through the course of this process. And then we've also got planned throughout this time period from, from about August until April, two in-person full day um, events that we're calling retreats at this time, and then one half day. So two, two and a half full days that we will all be together. Annie and I will be with you. You, the whole design, all your design teams will show up, will be together, and um, hopefully you will be recruiting others in your congregation to come be part of these retreats where we're actually doing some work and learning some more together about discovering our communities, connecting with neighbors and partners, and moving to action. So just a little bit more about each of the phases. So the discovery phase, um, depending on the congregation, you're kind of in the discovery phase from anywhere from two to four months. And, but I also like to think about you never stop discovering, hopefully your community. But some of the, what you'll expect to accomplish during this phase is learning about the gifts of individuals, both in your congregation and in your community discovering community assets and resources and strengths that you can leverage, um, and then also discovering potential partners. You could expect during this first couple of months that we'll meet on Zoom about three times. We'd also um, love to come visit you at your church. So we always find that really um, helpful to have us get to meet you on your turf and also learn more about your church and your communities. And so we'll plan a site visit during that first phase. And this is also when we'll have our first full day retreat where we are all together um, in, in uh, somewhere in the Newcastle Presbytery to be to determined. And then in the fall, we will move into the connecting phase and probably plan on about 
four months that will kind of be in this phase where Annie and I will mostly be interacting with you through some Zoom consultation. So you can plan on about five Zooms in the fall and maybe early winter, right after the holidays. And again, as I said, in each of these Zooms, we'll be bringing you some tools, um, inviting you to go use those tools in your community and bringing back what you're learning and what you're discovering and we can keep learning and growing together. You'll also be um, invited to get your congregation to join you in using these tools. Maybe you'll teach them a little bit about one of the tools and then you guys will use them together like one of our listening conversation templates might be an example. We'll also have another site visit with you after the holidays in early January. See how things are going, um, see what you're learning, but get to be right with you present in your church and community. And we'll all get together um, again for a half day in early January. And then finally, as we kind of move, I would say into the, the February, March, um, early April time period, um, you can expect a few more times to jump on Zoom with Annie as I, and Annie and I as we kind of start to land everything. So start to reflect upon what you've been discovering, finding some themes and patterns and discerning what is it that you think God is showing you about your community and where you might join in. And then when we'll get together for our last full day together in early April, and work with you, your design team, and hopefully some additional congregants to develop an action plan. So actually, this is where we're actually moving into the action and say, what now of all we've been learning and discovering and discerning in our communities, are we going to put together as our next steps of how we're going to be active um, in taking these learnings into something that's actionable? So discover, connect, act a little bit more about what's involved, a little bit more about the time commitment that's involved. Um, Annie, at this point, you want to add anything before I go to the next slide? Um, no, you keep you keep rolling. I'll jump in there. OK. Well, I think the next one is actually going to toss it to you. Yes. <laughs> so you can, you um, can jump in there. <laughs> As you know, uh, Amy and I have been doing this for a long time. I guess between the two of us, it might be, I don't know, 30, 40 years. I don't know. But we both together, we've been doing this work for a very long time. And we have both know that over this period of time, there have been so many new developments, so many new resources. And I have to not braggy, but this is really cutting edge stuff. A lot of that is due to Amy, who somehow finds the time to like find these these uh, these institutes that are practicing um, what could be asset based community development, could be you know other forms of community development, and uh, and she they're literally all over the world. And we have uh, the ABCD Institute. There's the um, one of the tools. We're going to go up to the top technology of participation you will learn how to facilitate a group in your church and ways to come to consensus, ways of methods of planning, methods of uh, discerning what issues are, are most important in, in among a group of people. Um, we use uh, some, the Abundant Community, Awaking the Powers of Family and Neighborhoods. This is the work of Peter Block, who um, has written, yes, Tracy Clapp, I, I, am, I am like a Peter Block groupie. And uh, his work is just, he really goes deep into why we do what we do, how we, how to connect with other people, how to lead meetings that are, democratic where little techniques like I want to say mutual invitation or something that will that facilitate having everyone at the table participate at the table and um, he teaches us how to have tough conversations conversations as he would put conversations that matter uh, and then there's uh, Amy has just started 
started putting a lot of curriculum together around design thinking and some work from the Human Systems Dynamics Institute. And I'm going to let Amy speak a little bit about those because it really is cutting edge techniques that um, organizations and institutions are using uh, to, to build leadership, to make better leaders, and to also uh, connect people, et cetera. So I'm going to let Amy talk a little bit about design thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And in, with, with both of the design thinking and the human systems dynamics, they sound like, whoa, what is that? And in the, they are interesting and they are fairly recent um, developments, you know, in the last 10 or 20 years, tools. But what you'll find is Annie and I share them with you. They are so simple. So this may sound like, oh, this is too much. This is going to be too complicated. It's not. It's you're going to be amazed at the simplicity, um, but yet the power of some of the tools that we'll be bringing. And so these are just uh, five bodies of work that Annie and I draw from that we'll be bringing to you from among other bodies of work. But just wanted to give you a little sampling of kind of where the tools and models will come from uh, that we'll be bringing to you along the way. So I'm going to stop sharing. I think that was all of the, the slides um, that we, we had for you and see, actually, I think I'll go to, um, you know, ask Cindy and Tracy if y'all want to jump in first and then however you want to facilitate some Q&A. I was just sitting here, and so especially for our pastors on the call, how many of us learned anything about stuff like this in seminary? Here's my hands all the way down. <laughs> yes. That's part of what I'm so excited about is this is this is work we need to be doing. I think it's central to who we're called to be, but I don't know how to do it. I mean, I could go, I guess, find a good resource and pick it up and try to digest it and then try to get people on board. But to have, to have such a fantastic team, not just teach us, but help us uh, stay accountable by checking in again and saying, Hey, you said you were going to do this last month. Did you? <laughs> oh, why? What, what happened? What was the roadblock? Oh, we can help you get over that. <laughs> Uh, it just, it feels like a way for us to answer our calling with some help and support. So we're not, we're not trying to build something new. It's already there. We're applying something that Annie and Amy have, have been able to play with now uh, for such a long time. Mm -hmm. I would like to just pull out one sentence that Annie said just a moment ago or a few moments ago. Um, and that was, we never stop discovering our community. Um, a lot of times uh, I was talking with a session last night about this program. And um, one of the questions, and this always comes up, is this like another program? Didn't we just do something 10 years ago? Didn't we do something five years ago? We did We did unglued, we've done vital congregations, we did this and, and so forth. Um, and the understanding that we never stop discovering our communities because our communities are always shifting and changing. People die, people are born, people move out, people move in, the economics change. Um, all the way around us, everything changes all the time. And so this discovery, these the, the skills that we can acquire and put into practice are not things that we'll do one time, figure it all out, set a plan and by gum, we got it. We're done. Um, this is the kind of thing that gets gets interpreted on an ongoing basis. We continue to learn about the people in our community and what they need. And our own churches change continually, too. Um, we don't always know it because they always look the same to us. We've been there day in and day out. Um, but the idea of, of not stopping the discovery is really exciting to me. And this helps to equip us to do that mindset shift that Annie was talking about, too. And I see, Susan, I'm going to just say one more thing, which is 
this is a nine-ish month process, um, but then you'll have the tools and you can do it again and again and again. Susan. Well, this really does seem like a God thing <laughs> at just, just the right time. Um, I'm in a congregation that um, is growing actually. And um, in thinking about what we would like to do, what we feel God has been calling us to do, um, there are lots of ideas swirling around and, you know, and I have to, I have to say, I'm just like everybody else. And I think this one thing would be great, you know, or this one thing would be just great. And I love what the program um, really helps teach us is not necessarily things that we want, but what the community might need and how we be in conversation with them about that. And you're exactly right. Communities change all the time. And certainly our community around the church is changing. Um, so I love it. This is really exciting. Uh, this is good stuff. And um, thank you. Thanks so much for uh, sharing that with us and giving us the opportunity to learn. Susan, Susan mentioned something that reminded me of another saying that uh, we use quite a bit. And once it's in your head, it's like really hard to get rid of. Not about me without me. Yes. Not about me without me. Yeah. How often do I come up with new ideas every day? No, 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 no. We have to, to ask people what they care about. Mm -hmm what they care about. And I've learned uh, over the years and particularly in the last four years in my congregation that as Susan said, things, and Tracy said, things are constantly changing. We're constantly discovering. And there's so many opportunities that we, that I never thought of when I'm dreaming up all my own good ideas. <laughs> Here's the hey other really fantastic piece of good news. Um, no one's asked the question, so we'll uh, anticipate <laughs> it. What's that going to cost? I mean, that's a that's a lot. That's three different site visits. It's two long full day retreats, one half day retreat. It's monthly zooms. It's it's tools. It's expertise. Um, well, this is directly in line with our Matthew twenty five commitment, and it helps lead us to build greater vitality. So the round table, um, along with the trustees have voted to significantly, significantly underwrite the cost. But we also know that we value what we pay for, yes? And that uh, making a financial commitment to participate is an important part of saying, yes, we're in. So we are going to use a sliding scale. You'll figure it out super, super fast. Mm -hmm. Churches, 25 members or less, and that's based on your 2023 statistical reports. And I have it open on my uh, browser so I can look it up if you're curious. <laughs> um, 25 members or less, $250 to participate. 50 members, 26 to 50, $500. 51 to 75, $750. Do you see the, so we're going by 25 member increments, whether, you know, wherever you are in that range, um, times 10, times 10. So we're hoping the intent is to make that affordable, but also scaled. So you feel like you've got some skin in the game. You feel like, um, yeah. This, this is something that we're invested in. Um, if, if any church says, you know, the number, our membership number is, is too big of a stretch for us, we've got flexibility. We've got flexibility. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, we're doing our best to make it as accessible as possible. If anyone wants their membership numbers, I can put them in the chat. <laughs> Amy, you were about to say something. 
Oh, I don't remember what it was. I don't remember. <laughs> so up I think I was just going to say, did anybody else have questions? Um, right. And I'm seeing there were some date questions as well that you're answering in the chat. Just coming back to Cindy's questions about the, the cost. So there's a congregation that had 100 members, it would be $1,000. Mm -hmm. And it keeps going up like that. Okay, yeah. 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 And like I said, um, yeah, if for any reason a congregation feels like maybe we haven't um, been as careful with our roles and those numbers are highly, uh, well, they don't, they're not in line with what we actually see on a regular basis. A, please take advantage of this opportunity to look at your active membership, but B, don't let that be a roadblock. Don't let that be a hindrance to participation. If there's really, if there's hardship in being able to participate, we can, we can help, but we really want, we want enough investment that you feel like it's important. Yeah. Yeah. And Amy, you're going to be in town with oh, us yes, in person next week, right? Yes, yes. On Wednesday, right? I'm going to be with you on Wednesday for lunch the in Dover. 19th, yeah. that's right, at Vincenzo's. So it's it's another um, information session. So I'll just that I'll be there in person. Um, and Annie won't be able to join me, but I'll be there just to answer questions and maybe... I, mean, I presume people on the screen could come, um, Tracy, but that maybe others that want to join up in person to just get some more information about it. Absolutely. So. And this will be not only sharing some of the same information that you had this evening, but um, it always new things come out because things are always shifting and you and you see new things um, and hear new things. Um, so it'll be a question and answer time as well as a presentation and it will be lunch. So we'll have lunch at Vincenzo's, which apparently is a really good thing to do from what I can tell. So. Oh, just you, I did send that information out to every clerk, every pastor, um, everyone on committee on ministries, COMC, um all the cres uh all the churches if there's just a church you know whoever you contact for that if you did not get the invitation for um the lunch you can um either contact me or you can contact cindy or you can contact donna and we will make sure you get the information nancy i saw your hand yeah uh question but uh, has the program been beta tested mm -hmm. Yes. So I I first launched it in 2019 here in Tennessee, <laughs> but it did get a little bit um, cut off uh, with COVID. So while I have not taken a congregation through the entire process, the thing to know is that it is very much modeled on what Annie and I first began doing together with Communities of Shalom. So we've definitely got experience walking alongside congregations um, through the, the very the very end. Um, and you know, and Annie, I was thinking about what you and I talked about this morning, just about what to expect um, sort of generally for your oh, congregation. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about your experience with that? Sure, I'll answer your question and I'll also respond to Nancy. Um, I have been doing this on the ground as a local pastor um, for four, I'm in my fourth year. I'm still discovering. My uh -huh. congregation is still discovering. Our design team uh, has shifted and changed and more new people have joined in and no one's left. That's interesting. Now that I think about it in four years, no one's left. Uh, and doing this on the ground, um, I, I can, I can talk all day about it actually, but I won't, I'll do it really briefly. Um, we've had, we started out with lots of obstacles, 
with, um, I think it was Barbara was saying, you know, oh, we got to find that sweet spot. And people don't want to do it. People aren't interested. They don't want to do anything. They're tired. They're, they, we've done this before, you know, the, the deadliest sentence in church life. Uh, we've done this. We've, we've always done this. Or we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and being in the local, um, being in a local congregation and being able to bring people along uh, we have really turned the corner and it took a long time. The first year people thought I had, I was from Mars. It was really difficult to kind of get to bring people along. And I had, um, I had a couple members say, I've lived in this town my entire life there. You know, what can you, what can you show me? And they're some of our greatest advocates now that are constantly out meeting new people that are, have joined the library board of directors, have joined the local shelters and have done all sorts of work in the community with other organizations. And now they feel really good because when they walk down Main Street, people know who they are. Mm. And as a as a pastor, that was important for me, too, because I came I moved into town four years ago. I didn't know anybody. And now I can't walk downtown without someone stopping and and chatting and I saw you at I saw, had someone just today say oh we met at the library gala hmm. now just go figure um and I forgot what your question was what you wanted me to say Amy um well I was thinking about so there are when we've um between Annie and I I don't even know I started to add up how many churches we've accompanied I know here in Memphis I've accompanied at least 30 churches uh, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, by the way. Um, didn't know if y'all knew that. Um, through this process of discovery and then coming up with something like how then now are we going to be different and, and connected and act within our communities. And one of the things that I saw time and time again is that, you know, we use the vital congregations. I know, because I'm going to use the word vitality, but probably not in the same context, is that the congregation became more vital. Mm -hmm. There was there was energy, there was excitement, there was just this sense of yes, we can and God has a purpose for us. And so that's the thing that also excites me is just having congregations sort of catch that spark again. And that's Annie, what I was thinking you, know, you and I were talking this morning about what you had seen recently. Right. Right. With, right. With just Robert recently. Bernard. I was just thinking about Bernard Jackson, who's came joined the church when I came. He was with me at, a, at the Presbyterian Church up the road uh, for several years. And um, we, you know, we we always talk about, we are, we're all fixated on new members and numbers and, or we get fixated on changing the community, right? <laughs> One or the other. We, we either need new members, got to get some more members in the door. Or we've got to fix all these problems that are outside of the door. And what I've learned, and Amy did say it, uh, is that the congregation became engaged. Mm -hmm. I I do like, I'm sure all of you, Tuesday night Bible study. It might be Thursday or Wednesday, but whenever. And w one thing that has energized our folks is being able to live out their mission. We have, we, we have, Bible study every week. And we talk about all the goodness of God. We talk about Jesus and all the things Jesus did. And when we're actually able to live that out, mm -hmm. just sharing the good news, sharing not and not in not in uh in an evangelical proselytizing kind of way, showing the love of God through the work we do is incredibly energizing. And we don't need a big, big programs and big, big successes to do that. Yeah. Uh, just to be connecting with other people in our neighborhoods is is enriching and really energizing. Really energizing when people are able to to live out their call, mm. as opposed to just being in worship on Sunday or just being in Bible study on Tuesday night. We actually. Um, uh, someone said, I think it's Jesus with skin on them or something to that, <laughs> right? But the hands, hands and feet, 
the hands and feet of Jesus, right? Um, and, and using these skills, and they're not scary, and most of us intuitively know that this is what we need to do. And uh, But using specific techniques to have a conversation with someone, to ask questions, asking good questions, as opposed to going into the community and telling everybody how great our church is, <laughs> to go into the community and ask, what is it that you care about? Mm -hmm. And and we have little templates with real simple questions. How long have you lived here? What do you like about being here? What are some of your challenges? Concrete tools, I'm, I'm banging on my hand, concrete tools that uh, bring breathe life into the gospel, breathe life into all of these fabulous stories that we learn and we talk about and pray about and we we experience in worship. And how great is that to do it on a Tuesday afternoon at the local coffee shop? It's just, it is energizing. Yeah. Ellen, it looked, <clears throat> it looked like you were gonna ask a question. Yeah, I'm just curious, like Annie, if you can share, it sounds like this kind of culminates with an action plan. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what our expectations from that action plan. Is that those personal action plans? Are those congregational action plans? Are those, well, I'd love an example of what you've accomplished maybe and what those action plans have looked like for you over the last four years, um, just so we can have uh, an understanding of what the tangible output as we're talking to, you know, our session and other folks. Okay. I like to say we're, we we uh, build the plane as we're flying it. We really won't know until we go and discover what people care about and what God is already doing out in our communities. Um, our An action plan may be something as simple as I, we, our congregation, is has added the Center for Hope and Safety is one of our missions, which is a concrete thing that we did this year. The Center for Hope and Safety has existed for 30 years yeah. in my county. But now we have concrete ways to participate and to help and make a difference. And that can be with our with material things like bringing over diapers or feminine hygiene products or whatever it is they need, or it may be uh, holding a fundraiser so that we can help with their operating expenses. Uh, there's th That's one kind of example. Another example I can think of is I am going to get up enough nerve to have an appointment and talk to the mayor. <laughs> because I've been hearing that people are really concerned about public safety. I've been hearing it. So now I'm going to work myself up and my action plan is to talk to the mayor about this. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm sure Amy's got a hundred examples of concrete things. I was just thinking of things that we've actually done yeah. in the last six months or so. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah, and I and Ellen, I think. Oh, I, go ahead. I was going to say, and, and, Part of what I hope we're hearing is that um, it's not necessarily the the action plan for every single thing that we want to do forever, but, right. but concrete, tangible things that, that create the stepping stones that move yeah. us along a path. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> Yeah, and I was going to say, as you just following up on what you said, Sydney, that was helpful. I had um, another colleague um this week in a, another conversation talk about the image of a compass mm -hmm. i think what you'll find at the end of this process is you know a little bit better mm -hmm. how to point the compass and because we've listened to the community and we've discovered what god is showing us in the community and there will be some next y steps action plan um that we will facilitate you to, to name. And I think Ellen, probably the, to answer your question, in this process, it's more about a collective action 
versus your own, although you're going to discover your own next wise step too. Mm -hmm. But I think we're looking for the design team at a minimum to say, okay, now we're going to help our congregation do these next three or four or five concrete things. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Yep. That works. And I did notice just one other question. So the, the things that are the dates and times that are posted are evenings and weekends, which are good for we working folks. But I just wanted, is that consistent then throughout the program? Because I know like unglued, I think there was a lot of during the day type stuff, which made it difficult for many of us to engage that's the plan is the offerings will be either Saturdays or I think the earliest we're looking at starting a Zoom would be 5 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question came through email. Uh, so one of our churches it has already been at work to create a consortium of churches in their small community to do this kind of thing. Would you be open to working with um, like a consortium? So it's not just the Presbyterian church, but a, a group of churches in a small community. <laughs> is that I feel... Oh my gosh, I'm applauding. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. I think that would be fantastic if, um, yeah, to, to work with a consortium. Cool. Annie agreed. I oh, think your absolutely. eyes got wide. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it, it also helps build relationships between the churches. Okay. We're accustomed to trying to get somebody to come to our Monday, Thursday dinner. <laughs> or we get invited to someone's Good Friday dinner or something, or we try to have an ecumenical day sometime in the fall, I think. We'll have some service where we come together. But coming together around mission, coming together around concrete things is real, is so powerful. And I've learned that um, they become much more willing to work with us and we become much more willing to work with them when we start building those relationships. It's much easier. Um, it sounds sort of abstract at first. Oh, I've got to get, you know, I've got to now, I got to work with the United Methodists down the street. <laughs> but it actually, um, once those you start forming those relationships, it gets easier and easier. And it really is ideal because your impact, your capacity grows and your impact is greater. Then, you know, just that one crazy pastor from the UCC that's always walking up and down Main Street to this is a group of a faith community group of us coming together to address mm -hmm. whatever that is, housing or or safety or what, whatever, whatever. So you, it helps build capacity, build relationship, uh, build your impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're at the end of our hour, but are there any other questions that are popping for you? If there are, because we all know how it works, half an hour from now, you'll think, oh, wait. <laughs> so you have both Tracy and my email addresses. You you know how to get in touch with us. And if it's not a question we know how to answer, like the one I posed that came in by email, we know how to contact Annie and Amy. So please, 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 any question that comes up, don't hesitate to shoot it our way and we will uh, we'll sort it out, whatever it may be. But I'm I'm excited. We're going to, and, and I just wrote down epic. It doesn't sound like epic as part of disco, but um, we're going to have some epic disco. We yeah. could. There you we go. Could. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to get a, a mirror ball, I think. Find that is so thing. fun. Hang it. We're, we're going to have theme songs. I know. Oh I was goodness. thinking I, we should have had music playing as people came on. <laughs> right. 
Wonderful. Thank you all for coming you. tonight. Tracy, so do you want to close us in prayer? I would love to. I would love to. Um, let's pray. Oh, holy God, we do give you thanks for the things that can spark our awareness of your Holy Spirit and give us new energy for that to which you call us. Our churches are eager to, to become part of the work that you're doing. And so many of us just don't know where to begin or how to start, or we see our limitations. So we're, we're so thankful for this, this possibility, this chance to think in terms of abundance, to think in terms of discovering in a fresh and a new week in and week out of the communities in which we live and the communities in which we serve. We give you thanks for this opportunity and ask your grace and your courage as we discern your call. And we give thanks for these two women who are doing such extraordinary work in their own communities and sharing that with the wider world. Be with us as we pray and discern and think and go about all the rest of the duties of our days. Keep us close to you. All of this we pray in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Good seeing everybody. Good to seeing you. Good right. Take care, all. Great.